All right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Today's talk is entitled Estimates in Oncology. Are we censoring for the right reason? Uh, my name is Kelsey Brown. I'm the Medical Writing Manager at TransPerfect Life Sciences in our London office. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. Today's event will run for approximately 60 minutes, including time for Q&A speakers uh, with our speakers at the very end. We can go to the next slide. Mark, I think you can go to the next slide. <coughs> Uh, this session is designed to be interactive and it works best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker by using the questions chat box in your control panel. And we'll answer your questions during the Q&A session. If you require assistance at any time, just contact me um, by submitting a message in your control panel as well. And you're, if you're in the audience, you are in listen only mode. So please note this session will be recorded and made available to you at the IDDI website for viewing in about 24 hours after the webinar is complete. This event is proudly sponsored or hosted by the International Drug Development Institute, IDDI. IDDI is an expert center in biostatistical and integrated eClinical services for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in several disease areas, including oncology and ophthalmology. IDDI optimizes the clinical development of drugs, biologics, and devices thanks to proven and statistical expertise and operational excellence. Founded in 1991, IDDI is headquartered near Brussels, Belgium with the U.S. Center of Operations in Raleigh, North Carolina. So now it is my pleasure to, intru to introduce you to today's speakers. We have Ms. Corinne Jamol, Principal Statistician of Consulting Services at IDDI. Corinne holds master's degrees in mathematics and biostatistics. She has more than 20 years of experience in biostatistics, clinical trials and drug development, and has worked for various companies, including BMS, UCB, GSK, Astellas, Merck, and Galapagos. Throughout her career, she has provided statistical expertise to cross-functional teams for the design, oversight, and evaluation of reporting of results of phase one through four clinical trials in various therapeutic areas, including oncology and inflammation and autoimmune diseases. And I'd also like you to introduce you to Dr. Mark Busey, our Chief Scientific Officer at IDDI. Mark holds a Doctor of Sciences in Biostatistics from the Harvard School of Public Health, and he is the founder of IDDI and Clue Points, two biostatistical service organizations based in the US and Europe. He's interested in clinical trial design, meta-analysis, validation of biomarkers and surrogate endpoints, statistical methods in oncology, statistical detection of errors and fraud, statistical monitoring of clinical trials, and medical data sharing. And with that, I will pass it over to our speakers. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, Mark Boyce here. I will start the webinar today by uh, giving you some background and the, also the outline of the, of the webinar. So the background is that we will talk about essentially progression-free survival and censoring in oncology clinical trials. And we will use to discuss this issue, uh, the new framework of estimates. My, my colleague Corinne will give you an overview of the estimate framework, and we will also touch on regulatory guidance. But before we start, I'll show you the outline of our talk. And we will start with a poll. We will have three polls in total uh, during the webinar. And the polls are aimed at you. So you should, um, if possible, vote for the uh, different polls that we will be presenting. And we will discuss uh, the results of the poll as we go. So we will have a first poll on centering PFS in general. Then we will, as I said, Corinne will introduce the estimate framework. We'll discuss something we call intercurrent events which is a very new and big and important item in the estimate framework. We will actually discuss PFS censoring conventions in trials that were published 
uh, in the last decade. And we will also touch on the FDA guidance. We will then have a, an, another poll, a second poll, on patients who receive non-study non cancer therapy uh, before they progress. And that will lead to a discussion on strategies for intercurrent events. Receiving another therapy is indeed one of the possible intercurrent events. And then finally, we'll have the third poll on missed CT scans. What happens to a patient who do not does not come back to his or her regular visits to have the tumor assessed uh, with a CT scan? And what do we do with these patients? And that will lead to a discussion on strategies for sensitivity analyses. So without further ado, first poll, get prepared to vote. Well, this poll will be, uh, as I said, on PFS, uh, progression-free survival censoring in general. Before we go to the poll, let me define progression-free survival. It's defined as the time from randomization date to the date of documented progressive disease, which we will refer to as PD in abbreviation, or death, whichever occurs first, and death from any cause, by the way. Even if the patient dies from another cause, that is considered to be a failure in the analysis of progression-free survival. And so the poll here is very simple. It consists of five situations. And for each of these situations, we will ask you whether you would uh, censor the PFS at the time of the event or not. And in fact, let me just say right away that there is no right or, or wrong answer for each of these questions. So you can you can certainly vote for each of these questions. Just just you know, tell us what you would do. And again, there will be no um, right or wrong answer for most of these questions. They will lead to an interesting discussion, hopefully. So the first question will be a patient who stops his or her treatment for toxicity before they've had a disease progression. Should the, should the progression-free survival of these patients be censored at that time or not? And the control goes back to to Kelsey for the poll to appear. I think we're just going to launch it. Oop. Okay. Um, I think we had a malfunction on the first poll, actually. I think maybe it closed automatically, so we might just have to skip to the next one. Oh, so we won't have the, because it says sharing poll results here, but it, I, we don't yeah, see it. Yeah, I think it okay. just closed before. Mm -hmm. it, it closed. So, okay, well, sorry, folks, but keep, keep trying for the next one then. This one was supposed to launch the uh, discussion, but we will certainly come back to two uh, interesting situations that you will be asked to vote for. Let me just read the questions before we move on. This, the five situations that we had thought about were situations described here. A patient, as I said, who stops treatment for toxicity before a progressive disease. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't see my screen. Yeah, I think you just have to reshare it. Mm -hmm. Reshare the screen, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me mm -hmm. see, how do I do this? I think you'll have to make me the presenter, uh, Kelsey. I don't know how to do this. Yeah, one because second. Because to me, it's working. So if you could make me the presenter, that would be better. Yeah, let me, let me reshare re it. Okay, let's try that. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So, uh, like I said, the five questions we had were, or the five situations we were thinking about, were a, a patient who stops protocol treatment before PD for toxicity. Should the PFS of that patient be censored or not? A patient who stops protocol treatment for some other reason than toxicity before they progress. A patient who switches to another treatment than the protocol treatment before PD. A patient who is in PD after missing one tumor assessment. And finally, a patient who misses two consecutive tumor assessments before PD. So these are five different situations that we will get back to and touch upon partly in the rest of the talk. And I'm going to move on to, to Corinne for the rest of the presentation here. Thank you, Mark. 
Uh, well, we are assuming that you are somehow familiar with the estimates uh, framework or concepts, but if not, uh, this is a short summary of what you need to know about it. So the estimates, uh, the, 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 the purpose of the estimate framework is to ensure that there is a, a, a link and uh, uh, alignment between the scientific question of interest, which triggers your hypothesis in your study, and the the, uh, estimation of the treatment effects which uh, will be provided at the level of analysis and in order to achieve that uh, the estimate is uh, consists of five attributes four of them are nothing new really and one of them is as a bit a slightly new concept um, so the the the, the attributes are the following. You have the target population, which is actually defined by the eligibility criteria of the study. Uh, you have the treatment conditions, which are being compared, so basically the, the treatment arms. Uh, the variable or the primary endpoints, uh, which could be, uh, it's, this is defined at the patient level, so this could be a change from baseline in a continuous measurement, it could be a response status, or it could be a time to event endpoint such as PFS. And then you have a population level summary, which will be the measure of your treatment effect. So uh, typically uh, for a time to event endpoint, this would be a hazard ratio, but it could be also for a continuous endpoint, a difference between uh, a mean change from baseline. And the fifth attribute is uh, intercurrent events, and this is actually a new concept, although uh, this, this, this was already thought of in a different framework in the past. So intercurrent events are defined as uh, events occurring after treatment initiation, and that would preclude observation of the variable of interest or would affect its interpretation. We have here a few examples of those uh, typical intercurrent events. We could have a treatment discontinuation of the patient due to toxicity. We could have a treatment discontinuation due to lack of efficacy. The patient could switch to another treatment or the patient could uh, make use of additional medication as a background therapy, or there could be a change in the background therapy that was foreseen in the protocol. So basically, these are uh, uh, kind of protocol deviations or situations that occur, and that would uh, affect the interpretation of uh, the outcome for the patient. So how to account for those intercurrent events? Uh, well, the estimate framework foresees that there is a, a, a thorough um, reflection about the way to handle these intercurrent events at the level of design of the study. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the guideline foresees five different uh, strategies to account for those intercurrent events. Of course, uh, this would depend on the scientific question of interest. And that scientific question of interest could depend on the stakeholder. Um, so those five strategies are the following. We have the treatment policy, which consists of ignoring the ICE, the intercurrent events, uh, uh, at the level of, of analysis. So this would mean that uh, anything that happens um, after treatment initiation is considered part of the treatments, which would uh, be the case in reality, actually. So this is the closest possible strategy to the, the, uh, the good old ITT principle. We have the hypothetical strategy, and that hypothetical strategy uh, would answer the question, what would have happened if the ICE had not occurred? Then we have the composite strategy. Uh, with that strategy, actually, you end up with a composite endpoint, which would include ICE as part of the potential uh, outcome for the patient. So this is, this is basically defining a composite endpoint. NPFS is one of them because this is considered as an event at the same level as progression. The while on treatment strategy considers only data collected before the ICE happens. So anything that happens after the ICE is ignored and considered irrelevant. 
And then we have a fifth one, which is the principal stratum strategy, which is also useful to address causal questions. But this is unrelated to censoring of PFS. Therefore, we will not discuss that one in the scope of this uh, webinar. So, as, as Mark said, the progression-free survival, which, which we will be discussing today, is a variable defined as the time from randomization to the documented progression or death, whichever occurs first. Of course, at the time of analysis, you might have patients with no event, and these patients are censored at the last tumor assessment, because this is the last date at which you are sure the patient did not progress. This is the basic censoring rule. Then the potential, um, yeah, the, the population level summary is typically the hazard ratio. And then you have a couple of um, uh, classical intercurrent events to take into account at the level of the design or the specification of the analysis. Um, and the question is how to account for them and do we need to define more censoring rules? So, in this schematic, PFS is presented in its basic version. So, what could happen? We have here three scenarios. The patient can be randomized, then he has to undergo the regular visits for the tumor scans, which are scheduled at regular intervals. Uh, and then um, the patient can be uh, detected with progression at uh, a certain visit. In that case, PFS is defined as the time from randomization to the time at which the progression is detected. Another situation would be that uh, all the tumor scans performed show no progression, but then all of a sudden the patient dies. In that case, PFS is, this, is defined as the time from randomization to death. Um, in those situations, of course, all you know is that um, the, the progression, uh, I mean, in the first scenario, the progression, what you know is that in reality, it occurred in between the previous visit and the visit at which scan revealed progression, right? So there is some uncertainty, but in general, this is well accepted because you have regular tumor assessments. And then if the patient did not progress and didn't die at the time of analysis, the patient is censored at the last tumor assessment because, again, this is the last one that showed no progression. So this is really summarizing the information we have. Patient up to then didn't progress. So this was the basic censoring rule for PFS. Now, what if we have missed scans? So if the patient misses a couple of consecutive visits, at which progressive disease could have been detected and then shows up at the next visit and is being detected in progression, what do we do with that information? Actually, all we know is that progression really occurred between the last tumor assessment that was actually done and the date of progression detection. So the uncertainty here is a bit larger. You have a huge gap in the information. And that is the same story with deaths. If the patient misses, for, uh, for instance, two consecutive uh, visits and all of a sudden dies, we don't know whether the patient progressed before dying, right? Uh, so this is uh, a situation where the, the FDA guidance uh, suggested that uh, we should maybe censor those patients at the last tumor assessment showing no progression rather than considering them in progression at the date it was detected, assuming that, um, well, considering that the date of progression actually, uh, uh, actually observed is, is, is unreliable. And then we have uh, intercurrent events that are traditionally a discontinuation of study treatment or a switch to another treatment. So these are, um, uh, these are situations that are not foreseen by the protocol usually, but then what if the patient progresses after a discontinuation or after a switch to another treatment? Should we consider that um, 
that uh, the, the, the information we have about the date of progression is unreliable. What should we do about it? Should we censor the patient at the time the ICU occurred? Should we consider this intercurrent event as an event? Or should we just ignore and continue to measure uh, the tumor until progression and uh, consider this is part of the treatment? Okay, in order to look at the, you know, what people actually did with these situations, we're going to look at some censoring rules that have been used in actual protocols. And uh, one way to do this uh, objectively is to look at some protocols that were made public in the New England Journal of Medicine after the publication of the trial report was uh, appeared in the, in the journal, uh, the New England made these protocols available. So we've just looked at these uh, protocols uh, and the specific section on censoring for PFS in these uh, different cases. And so, in fact, uh, let me look at some of these examples, one from Merck Sharp and Dome here, and I'm going to show you in, um, in kind of pink, uh, circled in pink, the censoring rules that were used in these different protocols. This one, for example, would censor at the last disease assessment before the new cancer treatment, uh, it would censor PFS if the patient had received a new anti-cancer treatment that was started before progressive disease. So this is fairly typical and you will see that many studies uh, use that convention. But that was in fact uh, the primary analysis. And as you can see, oops, sorry. As you can see, the, the sponsor here uh, considered this to be the primary analysis, but they also did some other uh, analysis. In particular, one consisted of censoring that observation at the last disease assessment. So this was censoring PFS, and this was the opposite uh, assumption where instead of assuming that the patient was censored at the last visit, they progressed the patient at the date of the new uh, anti-cancer treatment. So they considered the The patient uh, uh, needed this new treatment because they had progressed. So that was the date of progressive disease. Second case, an example from a study from Br Br Bristol Myers Quib, and you can see the references at the bottom of the slide here. If you need to, if you want to go back to the paper, uh, here in this particular study, they censored uh, cases again for a new anti-cancer treatment started before disease progression. So same thing as the sa as the previous case, they censor the progression-free survival uh, and consider the date of the la last evaluable tumor assessment prior to or on the date of initiation of the subsequent anti therapy as the date of uh, censoring. So the same convention as what we just saw. Here's a slightly different case from Pfizer, a, a study from Pfizer. Um, for patients who um, had a progression or death greater than 16 weeks after the last tumor assessment, so this is more the case of missed scans. In other words, there were no scans uh, uh, proving progressive disease for a long period of time. They censored these observations at the date of the last adequate assessment. And they also did the same as the two previous trials. They uh, censored uh, the PFS for patients who received a new anti-cancer therapy. So you can see some consistency, uh, but also some differences in the way the censoring is used. And the last example from Taiho, <clears throat> here you can see that the, there is more censoring of PFS. First reason for censoring is if the treatment is discontinued for other reasons than progressive disease, obviously. In that case, um, the, the sensor, if there is no post-baseline tumor assessment, in other words, a patient who receives no scans at all, well, then obviously you have to use the date of randomization as your censoring date. So this is really the worst case possible where the patient has no follow-up. Second case is when a new, a new uh, tumor, uh, anti-tumor treatment is initiated before PD, same thing as before they censor the case. And here they are a little more strict. They say that if there is one missed tumor assessment, not two consecutive, but one missed tumor assessment, they censor the PFS at the date of the last adequate tumor assessment. So again, some consistency, but some differences, and it shows that there is a you know, considerable variability in the conventions that different companies have used uh, in their analysis of PFS. So um, what conventions would be more most appropriate? 
And, and what about other inter intercurrent events? Uh, this is again a new concept, intercurrent events were prominently displayed in the guidance on estimates. And, and so anything that happens to the patient that's not in a sense expected to happen, such as a second primary cancer or um, the pandemic that we've lived through, the COVID-19 pandemic, which we will return to at the end of the webinar. What do you do if the if facility is inaccessible so CT scans can't possibly be given to a patient? Well, these are cases that of course were not expected, but that all fall into the guidance on estimates. Oops, sorry, I went back. Oh no, so here is the guidance. So what does the guidance, the FDA guidance says? And the guidance, uh, contrary to what many people think, the guidance leaves an, a lot of options open. It doesn't say that uh, you need to censor uh, uh, patients for all these different reasons. And, and so the reasons listed here are treatment discontinuation, death before the first PDS assessment. Oh, I'm sorry, no, no, that's not the case. The, a new anti-cancer treatment started, treatment discontinuation for toxicity or any other reason, and then death or progression after more than one missed, vi missed visit. So table, one, uh, table C1 of the guidance indeed uh, says that you can censor these observations. So in other words, uh, what most people have done so far, but if you look at table C2, in this table, as you can see, all these different cases are considered to be progressions at the time that the intercurrent event occurred rather than um, uh, censoring. And therefore, there is again considerable variability even in the guidance in itself as to what you can do. Uh, the only case that they consider to be a censoring cause is a treatment discontinuation without a documentation of tumor progression. Now, of course, this guidance predates the estimates framework, and therefore this guidance, of course, is in need of a revision. Um, but the guidance stresses uh, two, the difference between two things, primary analysis versus sensitivity analysis, and then censoring rules that are defined to address in the guidance that were defined to address both missing data, such as missed tumor assessments, and also intercurrent events. And of course, the two things are different. Missing a tumor assessment is not per se an intercurrent event. It's just a problem in the conduct of the study. It's not an event that occurs to the patient, as would be, for example, starting a non-protocol treatment. And so we need to make that distinction. And before we go into how to make that distinction, we will come to our second poll in, in the hope that this one will actually work. Um, the poll here is about a specific situation in which we ask the question, should the PFS be censored? The situation, again, is very specific. It's a situation for patients with advanced colorectal cancer who receive oxaliplatin or some other treatment. It's well known, and this of course was done a long time ago, oxaliplatin is now an approved drug for colorectal cancer, but it wasn't at the time. And suppose that this uh, oxaliplatin drug was compared with some other treatment. Now it's known, and it was already known back then, that oxaliplatin can achieve impression, in very impressive tumor shrinkage of liver metastases in some patients, such that these patients become operable. So they were inoperable at the start of the trial, and after receiving a few courses of oxaliplatin, their tumor shrunk it, to such an extent that the tumor could be removed surgically. Now, obviously, surgery is another treatment than the protocol treatment. And so the question is now, the PFS of patients who undergo surgery, should it be censored at the time of surgery or should it not be censored? Should surgery be considered an intercurrent event that you can ignore in the analysis? So essentially we ask you, would you, if you were in charge of this particular trial, comparing oxaliplatin to some other drug, would you censor PFS for patients who undergo surgery or would you not? Okay, we'll try and launch the next poll again here. There we go. All right. So everyone should be able to input their answers now. Uh, we still see our slides, uh, Kelly. No, you, you no, see the poll? You, you okay, should still okay. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, so this will come okay. up and then it'll close. Again. All right. All right. Yeah, I think participants see the poll. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So give everyone a few more seconds. Okay. We'll close that one now. Okay. 
do you want us to launch the answers? Perfect. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Oh boy, this is a perfect split, isn't it? Almost 52-48. <laughs> we could not dream of a better result because, as I said, um, to, when when we started the webinar, we said that there is no right or or wrong answer, and in this case, in particular, there is indeed no answer or wrong answer. It's it's not unreasonable to censor, but it's not unreasonable not to censor. And I'm going to uh, now let my colleague Corinne discuss this case in in a broader context. Corinne. Yeah, you'll just want to reshare the slide. Yep, perfect. Maybe you want to comment on the result first? <laughs> okay, I, I can comment on the result, Corinne, if you prefer. Oh, yeah, and then I, I, you will talk about this case in the more general terms. But so for those who who answered um, that the PFS of patients who undergo surgery should be censored, you could choose that option, it's not wrong, but you need to realize what the assumption is. The assumption that you make if you censor these cases is that these patients, in a sense, are similar to patients who are not censored. And, and so that, that's a very strong assumption. It's obvious that the best patients are those who can undergo surgery. And so if you censor these patients at the time of their surgery, in a sense, you you ignore all information on these patients afterwards. And it's very likely that these patients, because they've received surgery, will indeed have a tumor progression, but much, much later. Maybe some of them will be cured. Who knows? With the surgery, they will never recur and they will die of something else. So in a sense, I would personally feel that that censoring is really wasteful of very valuable information. Suppose that 20% of all patients in the oxaliplectin arm can can receive surgery, you're, go, you're going to kick out the information about progression, time to progression in these 20% of patients. And you know that these patients did will do very well on average compared with control patients. So you're going to harm the comparison of the oxaliplectin experimental arm with the control simply because you've ignored information about the best patients. So, you can use this analysis, it can be defended in some situations, but in my view, in this one, it's really hard to defend that this is a reasonable analysis. The second option makes more sense in my view, at least, because surgery indeed is an intercurrent event. Uh, if you ignore surgery by saying, well, that's part of the treatment, it's part of the oxaliplatin benefit is that patients, some patients may receive surgery. This is then justified because it directly results from the tumor shrinkage. And so, in fact, surgery becomes part of the oxaliplatin treatment strategy. So in this case, you would more look at the, the strategy of treating, treating a patient who receives the oxaliplatin and other things such as surgery, rather than just receiving the drug and then ignoring anything else. Okay, now on to Corinne. Thank you, Mark. Um, so as, as Mark already uh, uh, mentioned, the censoring rules that we've seen are used for both purposes of handling data limitations issues such as missing, missing scans or handling intercurrent events per se. In the estimate framework, uh, the distinction between those two situations is, is to be made clear. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, we have censoring for missing data issues, and we have censoring for intercurrent events. If we start changing the censoring rules uh, for a missing data issue, we are actually defining um, a sensitivity analysis, but we are still targeting the same estimates. If we change the censoring rules for handling intercurrent events, we are defining different strategies, and we are targeting then a different estimate because the intercurrent events and their strategies is one of the attributes of the estimates. And therefore, we are, we are defining a, a supplemental analysis rather than a sensitivity analysis. 
so if we take as an example, and this is uh, uh, the most common example of, a, of switching to another therapy during the course of a trial, then this is uh, obviously uh, considered an intercurrent event because this happens uh, after treatment initiation and it impacts the interpretation of the variable. Um, so uh, if we change the censoring rules for that type of ICE, we are actually changing the estimate and answering a different question. If we use a different estimate, then it's a supplemental analysis and not a sensitivity analysis. Now let's try to use that switching example to uh, to map it uh, to map the different ways of accounting for that into the estimate framework. We obtain then this kind of overview here, uh, where different estimates can be defined. If the clinical question of is of interest is does treatment improve PFS regardless of any therapy received, any other therapy than the original one, then we are defining a treatment policy estimate. We are ignoring the ICE. Uh, if we now uh, want to, if we now uh, target the clinical question, does treatment improve PFS in absence of non-protocol anti-cancer therapy, we are defining a hypothetical estimate. If the clinical question is, does treatment improve PFS or delay the start of subsequent therapy, we are defining a composite endpoint or a composite estimate. And in that case, uh, the treatment effect is actually measured by, by the prolongation of time to either of the following events, progression, deaths like the others, but also subsequent therapy. So we are really modifying the definition of PFS here, and it's actually moving to another endpoint, which is time to treatment failure. The fourth estimate, which I will mention here and come back to later on, is actually uh, uh, not something that we find useful in this particular context. This is the while on treatment estimates. And the question, the clinical question behind that, that fourth estimate would be, does the drug improve PFS before starting subsequent anti-cancer therapy? Which we found uh, a, a bit an irrelevant question in, in this particular context of PFS. So treatment policy strategy, this is the ITT principle, basically, nothing new here. Uh, and the question is, is PFS improved regardless of any post-randomization events? This is actually uh, the, the question of interest to the patients. Uh, we, want to, uh, uh, we want to estimate the net effect of the randomized treatments, possibly followed by any subsequent therapies. We consider that what happens to the patient after receiving uh, the, uh, the treatments is part of the treatment being compared to the other treatments, actually. And this is what really matters to the patient. Regardless of what happens next, will I improve my PFS by receiving this treatment? Of course, in order to be able to um, uh, answer that question and, and, and define that estimate, we need to make sure that tumor measurements are con continue to be, uh, to be uh, collected beyond the start of that new uh, anti-cancer treatment. So we should never stop collecting uh, tumor measurements if the patient switches to another treatment or stops protocol treatments. Of course, that's easy to say, but I think all efforts should be made to continue those tumor, tumor measurements. Uh, with a hypothetical strategy, the answer is, the, the question we want to answer is, what would have happened if the ICE had not occurred? Um, it addresses a question which is of interest to the sponsors. Uh, what is the effect on PFS if there is no protocol deviations and patients do not receive any subsequent therapy prior to progressing under uh, protocol treatment? Uh, if we 
want to address that question by censoring PFS at the start of the subsequent treatments, we make a strong assumption here, which is that the patient receiving the other treatment is at same risk as other patients not receiving that treatment. There are better approaches to, uh, to provide that hypothetical estimates that are uh, relatively well established in the world of, of, uh, of uh, HTA, actually. Uh, one of them is the inverse probability of censoring weighting. Then the composite strategy consists of, as I said before, uh, including that intercurrent event as one of the events uh, uh, in addition to progression and deaths. In that case, we are changing the gold standard definition of PFS and we are actually, actually targeting a, another endpoint, which is time to treatment failure. And this one is usually uh, used as a secondary endpoint only. The while on treatment strategy, as I said before, um, yeah, would consider that anything after the ICE is is irrelevant. So, uh, like like uh, like we do when using the simple censoring approach, we are truncating all observations after the time of the ICE. But in the way uh, the data are handled uh, later on in the analysis. Uh, we make a different assumption, and that actually, uh, uh, in order to uh, in order to provide that uh, while on treatment estimate, we would need to use uh, a, another method than just the Kaplan-Meier functions, and we would need to make use of the cumulative incidence functions. Okay, now uh, let's see how. Uh, these could be worded in a protocol, in reality, or in a SAP. Um, so if we want to describe the treatment policy strategy, uh, we need to define the five attributes of the estimates as follows. So you need a definition of the endpoint or the variable. So in this case, an example would be PFS measured by time for randomization until PD according to RESIST, depending on which criteria you are using, as assessed by BICR or death, whichever occurs first nothing new here. Then you would need to define your population, which is defined by the inclusion exclusion criteria. And then you would need to describe the treatments being compared. Uh, there comes the, the time to uh, list your pre-specified ICEs and then mention which strategy you will use uh, in your treatment effect estimation. So for deaths, uh, and it's probably a bit redundant because this is already part of the definition of PFS, so for deaths will be handled as a composite strategy. It is part of the endpoint definition. It is considered an event as such. Discontinuation of treatment. Here we just propose to use the treatment policy strategy. This will be ignored. So the patient will continue to be followed up as usual, even though they discontinue treatment. And the start of subsequent anti-cancer treatment, as we said, we would here target also the treatment policy strategy. This would be treated the same way as a treatment, dis as a treatment discontinuation. And finally, you need to define your protocol, your population level summary. In this case, traditionally, this is the hazard ratio. If we now want to describe a hypothetical strategy for that particular ICE of switching treatments, uh, the only change that would need to be made is at the level of uh, the ICE strategy for that particular one. And in this case, you could describe it as a start of subsequent anti-cancer treatment, hypothetical strategy. Patients who received subsequent treatment are censored assumed to have the same risk as those who did not. This is basically what is being described if you decide to go for the simple censoring approach. And a population level summary treatment population, all of this remains unchanged. The composite strategy here would consider the switch to other treatments as an event as such. So you would need to mention the composite strategy in your list of uh, ICEs and strategies. Of course, here, as I said, you're, not, you're no longer using 
PFS, but you're using time to treatment failure. So this will need to be reflected as well in the definition of, in the definition of the endpoints. And you would need to list other anti-cancer therapy as the list of events targeted here. All right, back to the poll. Um, we will now move on to the other uh, main problem that we wanted to discuss today, which is not an intercurrent event, but rather the fact that the patients miss some of their uh, scheduled CT scans. And we want to do this in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So suppose that you are now in the pandemic like we were about a year ago or maybe 15 months ago. We know that the pandemic severely reduced the access to the CT scan facilities. And some patients, because of that, missed at least two CT scans and were at the, uh, in progressive disease at the first CT scan afterwards. In other words, they did not have two CT scans or more. And then when they came back, for the next CT scans, they were found to be in progressive disease. Three options here. First option, the PFS of these patients should be censored at the time of their last CT scan showing no PD, essentially the, the regular, uh, uh, let's say, FDA centering rule for missed scans. Second option is missing scans could, should be ignored, so completely ignore the pandemic, and patients are only considered in progressive disease at the time that the progressive disease was actually detected, which is after they came back to the scans after the pandemic, essentially. And the third option is similar to the second, except that instead of using the sort of right censoring rules that we typically use in a time to event analysis, now we are going to use another statistical technique, which is called interval censoring, where essentially an observation can be censored right or left, and we call this interval censoring. We know that the event of interest occurred in some interval prior to the observation time. And the right censoring is the opposite. The, uh, the observation is before the, the event, and the, the event will occur to the right of the observation time. Now we know that it occurred sometime to the left of the observation time, and we use interval censoring to reflect that uh, problem. So how would you vote for this? I'm going to ask Kelsey to launch the poll. OK. You should see it now on your screen, everyone in attendance. So I'll give everyone about 10 more seconds, and then we'll close it. Okay, all right, I guess we'll go ahead and close that one and we'll launch the results. Okay, so this is interesting. Most people favor the uh, third option, which was to use interval censoring. Uh, then the second choice was in fact to censor uh, as FDA recommends. And the third one, 17% um, of people only said that these um, missed scans can be simply ignored. So let me try to show my screen again and we can comment these answers, hopefully. Do you see my screen? Oh, I no, think you just don't. need to reshare. Yep, perfect. Okay, good. So, oops. Okay. So, so here are some comments on the, these three options. Um, we discussed this already. If you censor the observations at the time of the missed scans, in other words, before the pandemic, and you ignore all the information that you collected after the pandemic, in fact, you, you not only do you waste a lot of information, but you also severely overestimate the PFS um, because, in fact, it can be shown in Corinne will uh, mention this after afterwards in a more general context. But if you censor the observations, you tend to overestimate the PFS, the median PFS. So if you're interested in looking at the median PFS per treatment arm, that censoring, in fact, will result in a in a longer PFS, a longer median PFS than is actually the case. And that, of course is undesirable. Now, mind you, the treatment effect itself, in other words, the hazard ratio, which we will use to compare the two uh, treatment arms, is not going to be biased very much, if at all, even if we do this censoring. 
at least if we assume that the centering is, the, in, is done in both arms about equally. And that is probably going to be the case because if a facility for CT scans is closed because of a, a pandemic, then you know patients both in the control arm and the treatment arm in that center won't be able to come to the scans equally. And so you expect the impact of the pandemic to be equally distributed among the treatment arms. So that doesn't create a differential bias, but it will create a bias in terms of estimating the length or the median of PFS. The second option, uh, again, also, if you ignore uh, the, the missed scans completely, if you say, well, I don't care about the pandemic, I'm just going to s pretend that the patients had a progressive disease at the first time that I saw it. This is, again, consistent with the ITT approach. It's just strictly intention to treat, ignoring that some data were not measured as they should have been. Well, this, again, uh, overestimates the PFS, it again does not bias the treatment effect if the two treatment arms are equally affected by the pandemic, but it will also overestimate the PFS, although not as much as the censoring would do. And then the third approach is indeed, uh, in our opinion at least, uh, preferable um, to the second one and even uh, even more so to the first one. So we believe that the third approach is probably, uh, in the case of pandemic, at least when there are many missing data, that would probably be the right method of analysis. Corinne? Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, so um, the problem with the missed CT scans um, is that, okay, it's a data limitation. So uh, this missing assessment is usually assumed to be non-informative. Uh, if you decide to censor those patients who missed consecutive CT scans uh, because you don't trust the date of the, of the progression that is observed later on, uh, well, the same estimate is still targeted. You're just defining a sensitivity analysis uh, to evaluate the impact, the impact of that uh, missing data issue on the results. In some cases, uh, those missed CT scans are due to an, an intercurrent event, like Mark mentioned before. Or you could have uh, facilities, uh, healthcare facilities closure due to the pandemic. In this case, uh, this consecutive missed scans situation should be considered as an intercurrent event. Of course, this is probably a semantic issue. But still, I mean, you're just you're just defining a new estimate. You're defining if you censor those patients uh, for uh, uh, missed scans due to closure of healthcare facilities, you are defining an estimate which would evaluate the treatment effect in absence of pandemic in a world without pandemic. So, what will your protocol or SAP uh, uh, look like in this case. Suppose we are um, uh, pre-specifying an ICE for the miscans due to the pandemic. In this case, you would need in the ICE section of your, uh, in the ICE attribute of your estimate, you would need to specify that uh, the more than two scans uh, uh, missed due to the pandemic uh, will be handled handled using a hypothetical strategy and those patients who missed two scans due to pandemic will be censored assuming they have to stare at the same risk as those who did not which is a strong assumption once again um, now if you uh, assume that all of your patients who will miss two consecutive uh, scans will be handled the same way, then you can also uh, modify your definition of the variable by adding that a little bit here, uh, saying that um, this will be time to uh, events occurring within two scheduled tumor assessments from last assessment. In the other example that uh, we have here, we are just describing the situation regardless of the pandemic. So the general situation where you have a few uh, patients who, who missed two consecutive scans. In this case, 
you will just have to describe something similar, but not in the ICE section of your estimates, because this is not considered an ICE. You will just need to make sure that this appears in the censoring rules, but the description is similar. So a couple of things about this censoring. Um, if you have a lot of situations for which you will censor the patients, like it is suggested in the table C1 uh, of that FDA guideline, you might end up with a considerable loss of, of power due to the drop of the number of events used in the analysis. Um, so if you do not want, want to, to, to lose power, you might decide to catch up the number of events by delaying the time of analysis and accruing more events in your study. In that case, you will need to apply a closer monitoring of the events, taking that censoring into account. And you will have, of course, to wait for the analysis to take place. As Mark mentioned, um, the, the censoring has also an impact on the median estimation. If you censor a lot before the median PFS is reached, this will, uh, well, if you censor events uh, that are observed before the median is reached, you might, you might overestimate the median. And for some ICEs, the impact on the two arms might not, might not be uh, balanced. Uh, so as an implication, you might end up with some bias in your PFS hazard ratio, but this is relatively robust uh, as a statistic. The more, uh, the, 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 the most, uh, the, the, the most, um, the, the statistic that will be most impacted is actually the median PFS. There you might end up with large bias. And uh, the example that we will be showing here is an extreme example in which um, we have a, a larger median PFS in arm B than in arm A. Um, and we are just considering this, um, uh, this little sample of four patients only, uh, just to illustrate uh, the impact uh, that could have uh, censoring for pandemic uh, in case that hits the study. So if you are unlucky and if your pandemic uh, uh, hits the study at the time uh, PDs are occurring in one arm rather than the other, or at least to a, to a, a, a huger extent, um, then the impact will only be in that arm, obviously. Uh, in that case, if, uh, if due to the pandemic, the, the, the healthcare system need to close for a certain period, those progressions that should have been observed during that period will be observed at a later time. So there are two options. If you detect those progressions at a later time, you might consider that you should use that date in your PFS assessments and use the treatment policy strategy. The only thing is that this will be observed with some delay. And the other option would be to use the hypothetical strategy and to censor those patients prior to the pandemic. In both cases, well, in the first case, the treatment policy, uh, your PFS will be slightly overestimated. In the other case, if you censor uh, those events, and if those events would be observed before, uh, before the median is reached, then you are even more overestimating your median because those events will not occur anymore before the median. They will be censored. Um, so, um, this is also to be considered at the time uh, you define your censoring rules and your estimate. Do we really want to use that censoring method for uh, targeting the hypothetical um, estimates? So now it's time for some conclusions. <clears throat> As we saw, um, the censoring rules uh, should not only be 
pre-specified, but they need to be critically considered as they address different scientific questions. They should never cause the follow-up of patients to be disrupted. The estimate framework is helpful to discuss all these things. It puts some light on the reasons uh, behind the censoring and the purpose and the, and the rationale for it. It is relatively recent. We are still on our learning curve uh, with that estimates framework. And there is a need to harmonize the guidance, the guidance documents. As we saw, uh, the FDA guidance uh, that details those censoring rules uh, does not take this estimate framework into account, of course. And some useful references here. Um, for your usage. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to the both of you, uh, Corinne and Mark, for your presentation. Um, I know we're kind of running low on time here, and we wanted to get to at least a couple of questions before we wrap up. Um, so I'm joined by Dr. Everard Osad, a medical director at IDDI, who will be facilitating the Q&A portion of um, this webinar. So. Just a quick reminder to everyone in the audience, um, you can still submit questions in the questions panel and anything that we don't get to, we will chase up um, after the webinar with you um, individually. So Everardo, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, uh, Kelsey. Thank you very much. And, and thanks, uh, Corinne and, and Mark, for this great presentation. So, yeah, I didn't want to waste the, 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 the nice questions that we had from the audience. And if you, uh, by any chance, have to leave or if you have asked, uh, sent us questions that we don't address, like, like uh, Kelsey said, we'll get to, back to you in, in writing. So, so Corinne, uh, Mark, I have some uh, questions here. The, uh, the first is um, for uh, the while on treatment strategy, um, are you proposing uh, are you proposing to use uh, sorry I'm always, always have trouble reading this are you pr proposing to use competing risk uh, methods for the while on treatment strategy uh, for the while on treatment well actually the problem with the while on treatment strategy is that uh, it addresses a question that is a bit irrelevant here. Who would be interested in knowing whether the treatment uh, prolongs time to progression or PFS before switching to another treatment? So that's more a matter of, um, yeah, in this particular context of time to event, uh, I'm not sure this this uh, this is a bit, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a a weird question but indeed if you would need to uh to target a while uh, on treatment uh, estimates you would need to indeed use that uh, that com yeah the competing risk um, uh, methods using the cumulative incidence functions thanks Corinne. maybe this one is also for you um in the covid example uh can we use method one for primary analysis and then um, uh, for sensitivity analysis by method three with interval censoring. Uh, so remind me, method one was the... Uh, good question. Ignore. Method one was ig ig ignoring. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, well, the problem with interval censoring is that it has not been broadly used for uh, in, in, in regulatory submissions, for instance, this is a, a method that is usually uh, uh, of interest for sensitivity analysis or um, or, or maybe a, a HTA. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, but I've never seen it being applied for a primary analysis. Um, so, yes, um, I think the ITT approach or the, the treatment policy approach is still the best one to be used. Uh, censoring for these things is, is, is the last one to be used, in, in my opinion. Also, um, uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, when we target a hypothetical estimate, simple censoring and then usage of uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, Kaplan estimate is probably uh, the, the most biased method to be used to target a hypothetical estimate. There are other more sophisticated and complex methods that, that would address the question in a less biased way. 
and we did not uh, go into that level of detail today, but that might be another another topic for another webinar, actually. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. And I think we have time for one more. There, there are uh, quite a few, so let's let's get one more. And I and I guess most people will probably have to leave. Uh, so the the last one is why not using interval sensoring for two consecutive missing tumor assessments, uh, regardless of of pandemic, for example. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, yes. We did not mean to restrict the usage of that method for the pandemic. Uh, I think if we need to define a sensitivity, and sensitivity analysis to address the, the issue of the consecutive miscans, this is uh, probably also a good approach uh, for a sensitivity analysis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will take the liberty of reading a comment, actually. It's not really a question, but uh, one of our uh, viewers ha has a comment. Maybe maybe you, you would like to to rebut to that, uh, Corinne, or, or maybe just uh, say, say what you think. So the, the person says, uh, I would like to note that the strategies outlined in the ICH E9 were meant as examples and do not present an exhaustive or mandatory list, similar to your example of the FDA definition on PFS event slash censoring being illustrative and not a fixed recommendation. The same holds for the ICE handling strategies. The manner of uh, presentation gave the impression that those strategies are uh, the only endorsed ones. I, I thought I should read this because maybe this requires some, some clarification. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, the guidance only mentions those five strategies. And uh, to be honest, I cannot think of another one. Uh, I could even hardly think of an example where the, the fifth one, the, uh, the, the principal stratum, would be uh, applicable uh, in, in, in my experience. Um, but I, I, I cannot imagine another strategy uh, outside of, of, uh, of those that are already defined in the guidance. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks very much. Kelsey, back to you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Everardo, for facilitating those questions and answers. Um, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for submitting your questions. Um, just a quick note here, again, we'll chase up with any um, questions that were outstanding. And if you have any further questions or comments, you can forward those to info at IDDI.com. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up email from us with access to the recorded archive for this event, and a survey window will be popping up on your screen in just a minute. So after the webinar closes, we'd really appreciate um, your participation in the survey. It really gives us some um, insight into um, how we can improve on future webinars. So um, just a final thank you to our speakers, Ms. Corinne Jemmel and Dr. Mark Busey for that super insightful presentation. It was very fantastic. I think it had a lot of great insight from our viewers as well. Um, it's been my pleasure, everyone, to be your moderator. And on behalf of the team, we thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.